My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining us for another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. I really appreciate your patronage. My guest today is Jonathan Green. Jonathan is a real estate investor and team leader, concierge agent, as well as a certified life coach and real estate coach. Uh, he is also a former attorney, gallerist, museum curator, and educator who left standardized employment to pursue a lifelong obsession with real estate investing full time. Jonathan, how are you today, sir? Doing great, David. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a pretty interesting background. That's why I wanted to have you on because I read all of this and I thought, wow, this guy has some, some interesting depth to him. So let's see if we can try to get through to some of that, that depth. Can you start with how you became interested in business, developed an interest in real estate, and you also developed an interest in Zen, if I am correct. So how did you get started with all of this and where do they intersect? Uh, yeah, great place to start. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I, my, my interest in business and all things kind of trading, which includes now obviously real estate really came from my, my dad. Um, you know, I was a child of divorce. My parents got divorced when I was two and I spent weekends with my dad and growing up, we would just do a lot of, I would say, uh, more adult stuff because he was busy and the weekends when he wasn't working, we were out doing real estate stuff that I didn't know at the time, but my dad was always making deals, helping people, looking at properties, going to yard sales. I mean, he was just doing things that are 30 years ahead of his time. Um, mm -hmm. And I was kind of along for the ride. And I think, you know, growing up, you know, you're so kind of obsessed with yourself as a child and can't see outside of it. But as I started to get older, uh, especially like after high school, I really started to look at what he was doing and start to be amazed. And then I started to participate with him. I started kind of managing properties in the summer, collecting rent. Um, and he was involved in lots of different business entities. Um, and also in terms of how to structure your business entities, I have a lot, I had a lot of properties in my name as a kid for tax purposes. And, um, I think it's one of those things where you, you know, it's all happening when you're younger, but then as you get a little more perspective, uh, you start to realize all the things you've learned the whole time. And that kind of crystallized even really after a whole career in law and art, when I went into real estate uh, full time, I've always been an investor. But when I got my license and paired it with my investing, everything started to kind of just come right to the forefront of my mind and all the things that he he taught me. Um, and then to transition to what you said about Zen, I uh, I had built a big team about four years ago, and it really like drove me out of the business. I, I didn't. I didn't run it correctly. I was thinking scale instead of personal touch. And it just got away from me. I had a partner and it was just like, I was getting calls from five in the morning till midnight. And I remember, you know, being at a table dinner was just me and my kids and me saying to them, oh, I need to, I need to take this call. And like, when I said it, I got so angry at myself that I, of course, I don't need to take the call. I mean, need and want, or even the necessity of it was, was beyond me. And at that point, I just went really, really deep into kind of a more mindful lifestyle, started studying a lot of Buddhist principles, mindfulness, meditation, um, and getting into meditation really just adjusted 
honestly, everything about the way I do business and my whole life, uh, you know, I had already started to adjust out of kind of being like rigid growing up. And this was just another way to help me kind of loosen myself up, but in the right way. Um, yeah. And it's really, I think it helps me now, you know, I turned 50 this year and it just, it helps me to get more mindful as I get older because it just makes me healthier overall. Yeah, well, congratulations on uh, joining the Big Five O squad. Thanks. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, when people talk about Zen, people talk about Buddhism, the definition I'm sure you know can vary based on who you talk to. How do you define Zen exactly? And how does that definition di differ from what you think is the common perception? Mm, great question. I mean, for me, like a state of Zen to me is a sense of calmness about myself. I think a lot of people are so busy trying to control things that they can't control, uh, which I did for a number of years. You, you get nowhere because you can't, yeah. you can't control that. So when I went inward and just started to focus on only the things I can control and accept the things that I can't control, uh, it brought me to a sense of calmness that stays with me throughout the day. And starting every day meditating for 30 minutes just puts me into the mindset where I'm already okay with being still. And for me, Zen is like a state of mental stillness, which some people think is, oh, well, you're not getting a lot done. No, th the more still I get, the more I accomplish, you know, and I think it's... Yeah. Uh, very important in that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember working in, you know, what I call the grind or the rat race, yeah. uh, working for all these different marketing agencies, and you would work from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. at night. Sometimes people would stay later. But the thing is, you're not getting paid for those hours after 5 p.m. So right. why are you there? You're not getting paid. Odds are you're not going to get a promotion unless you marry the boss. So, you know, why are you there? And I saw, I realized it's like, I remember talking to my wife once and we took out a calculator and we calculated how many hours per week I'm working versus how much I'm making. And when I saw what the numbers were, I just said, this is insane. I would make more money doing anything else. Yeah, that that's a great point. And part of the, one of the calculations that I've really done throughout my life, at least, especially in the last 10 years, is I would calculate what I believe I'm worth. And when I'm focused on myself and my self-awareness is high, my self-value, which translates to my self-worth, is high. So when I look at the activities I'm doing and what they're bringing in, like my return on investment for doing X or Y, it needs to be at least at the amount that I think I'm worth. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing that on a pro bono basis. And once you boil it down, exactly like you said, that calculation doesn't work out. Um, I worked for the government for, for seven years and I didn't get paid a lot and I worked 80 hours, but I was working, you know, I was a prosecutor. So I was in the system doing what I believed was good. So uh, that was a trade-off for the hours. Um, and it will, certainly wasn't go to how much I was worth, but if you take it on the outside and I look at it from real estate, which is a commission business, you know, you don't know whether you're going to get the commission. So you have to evaluate and make your time the most efficient possible, or you're never going to make any money, which means you're not going to make anybody happy. You're going to fail everybody, which includes most of the time people beating themselves up, which is something I learned not to do um, at all. Yeah. Uh, how much of this do you think is really ego? Uh, a gigantic <laughs> uh, part. That's a fantastic. I mean, I think, you know, growing up, you're just full of ego because you're a kid or a teenager and the world revolves around you. Uh, and then as you do well in something, you know, you your ego is just boosted. The male ego is definitely uh, one that can escape uh, a lot of us. And I know I uh, I know there were times I, you know, especially like in court, you know, I'm trying to win to win. But am I doing the right things? And I think you know, going back to what we said, for me, getting to these parts of Zen or stillness in my life, it takes the ego away. Um, my first team was uh, the name of myself and my partner. And when I made a new team, it's not, it's, it's my team's called Streamline Properties on Market. It doesn't have my name because I didn't, I didn't want people to feel like they were working for me. I wanted them to feel like we're all working together for a company. And that really is another mindset shift where, I did used to make a lot of the stuff about me. Look what I did. I, li I, literally, 
I just did a webinar today on uh, real estate newsletters. I hosted it and it was all about how I don't, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not trying to sell people. I'm just trying to be an advisor and a mentor. And through that, I do fine in business, but I don't, I don't want 10,000 clients. I'd like a thousand good ones or less. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they can keep the smoke coming out of your chimney, so to speak. Whereas more clients who aren't necessarily a good fit can take up more time, cause you more stress, which makes you need to take more time off, reduce the quality of your life. Yeah. And I mean, if you just transition that to something I know we talked about in our pre-call on social media, it's like people are so obsessed with chasing followers and like followers mean absolutely nothing. Clients mean something or people who really like you, but people do follow for follow culture everywhere. So if I, if someone who has a thousand followers never interacts with any of them and I have a hundred and I interact and work with 50 of them, I'm going to make 50 times as much money as they are and make 50 times more people happy because I'm not just catering to anybody. I'm very like niche worker in everything that I do. I don't want to appeal to everyone. Uh, and going back to my time in the art world, I was in the art world for six years and I did a lot of shows that I knew weren't for everybody. Uh, and, you know, the response would be, uh, you know, either good or bad. And someone would say, well, doesn't it upset you when they have a negative response, you know, to the to the show that you put up? And I said, no, I mean, love and hate are so close together. A reaction is what I want. The worst thing for me when I was a curator was for someone to come in and just go, huh? No reaction at all. Yeah, exactly. very, very, very true. I, yeah, very true. I mean, I remember going to many museums where you would have exhibits where people would get all upset, um, but it would increase the patronage. It would we would sell more tickets. Whereas if they felt nothing at all and were completely ambivalent about it, it would just the actual uh, you would see fewer people there. And in marketing, obviously, you don't want that. So. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't think I ever, I mean, I never wanted to, you know, force uh, a response, but I just, the middle ground is just so boring to me. You know, like uh, when you, you know, if, when, when I, I started flipping houses in Florida, there wasn't much I could do when I was buying in developments, like they were 14 shades of beige on the outside. There's only so much you can do, you know, and then you buy outside of a development, you can completely change the dynamic, which again, you know, if you paint your house one color, someone's not going to like it. But I'm looking for people who love it if they want to buy it and not the people who six people who are like, it's OK, it's like the other ones. And then they're always just trying to get a better deal instead of just falling in love. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Now, looking back on all of this in hindsight, your journey as a as a whole, what would you say is like one of, if not the most important lesson that you've learned from your journey? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's really a hybrid. I mean, my dad's catchphrase that I use, which is the name of my coaching business is don't rush life. And it, it was just something that he used to say to me all the time. And I, you know, I'd kind of be like, okay, great. Thanks for that. What do I get out of that? And then I, the older I get, the more I understand it. Like, why are we all trying to rush through to get things or to get to everything. Cause when we do that, we're missing everything that's in front of us. I mean, honestly, I used to go on walks and I would not even be looking at anything around me. I'd be like, you know, on my phone or, or like just not there texting the whole time. Now I walk aimlessly all the time. I don't have a direction. I just go until I'm done. And that helps me on the creative level um, just get so much more out of it, not having a kind of a destination. So it was that, and then coupled with becoming a parent. And I think, uh, you know, we talked about ego before. There's nothing that takes your ego away more than becoming a parent. It's just to completely erase my ego. I didn't care. I just became all about <laughs> my children. There was really nothing else that I, I nothing was going to get even close to it. Everything was directed around, you know, trying to be the best dad that I, that I could be. Yeah, I want to ask you, and, and I agree with everything you said. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of transitions going from working full time in marketing and, and then stepping away. And then having my own little LLC, then saying this is the, even this is too much. It's more overhead than I need. Just be one guy. Just be one guy. Uh, and, and slowing things down especially now 
Um, I think with so much disinformation and political polarization and tribalism, um, I, I think being alone with your thoughts is something a lot of people aren't accustomed to. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think they're scared. I mean, I think it's uncomfortable yeah. to be alone with your true inner thoughts and accept that you're not as perfect as you think, or, you know, these days what you're trying to portray on some, you know, site instead of just being yourself. I mean, I make a lot of video for, for business and every one I make with no script, I just turn the thing on and go. I don't edit them. I literally don't care. Um, and I have that on my team always makes fun of me because they have memes of me that say I literally don't care, but it's really a process of just, I'm just going to be myself. Obviously, there's stuff that's going to be more edited, but uh, I, I feel like it's all about self-awareness. And the, the more self-aware I get, the better I am with other people. Uh, and as an introvert, it's still hard with other people. But the more I know myself, the more I'm able to balance kind of how what I need and when I'll be at my best with other people. Yeah, I think it's really not so much about being a certain way as maybe just being in touch with yourself and what you need emotionally, intellectually, you know, if you believe in the soul, what you need for on a spiritual level, just being truthful about what you need and why you're doing what you're doing is what you're doing because of peer pressure and what you think you need to be doing or what others told you is there, is it what you really want, what you really feel? Um, Toward that, I wanted to ask you about your view of social media, because being in marketing, I've got very mixed feelings about it. I know I, I think 99% of the time it's misused. And I'm, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, because I'm a webhead. But I fall into the trap all the time where I respond to people's comments. But what does it accomplish? Yes, it, they, they don't agree. I'm saying something about marketing as an example. They don't agree. But I've been doing this for 20, 25 years. If you disagree, that's fine. But there's probably a nuance or some context here that you're not seeing or we're not communicating or something. I wanted to get your take on it because I thought what you said and your approach was very interesting that you dropped everything ex except for Instagram, what happened and why? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, well, it was at the same time where I, I shut my team down and I just went inward for an entire year, did not do anything related to real estate, logged off all, deleted all my accounts. I didn't leave them on. I deleted them all except Instagram. Um, I was never, uh, I mean, I, I in business, I was running Facebook ads. I was doing a lot. But I just found that when I looked back at how I use social media, like it wasn't good for me. I wasn't getting enjoyment out of it. You know, it was more, uh, I don't like the algorithms. They're putting stuff in front of me that I don't like. Uh, and I don't like, it just doesn't make sense. You know, and I've used a lot of different products where I can't make heads or tails of how it works. So I've had to figure out what's my best case use scenario and use it the way that I, will get me the most enjoyment. I honestly don't care what I get out of social media for business. I assume if I put out content, the, the right business will come to me, but I really make stuff that I like and don't really think twice whether somebody else is gonna like it. I just know it's, you know, it's good. And when it comes to my personal stuff, I do it for me. Like I'm pretty, I do a lot of Instagram stories because I'm always flipping houses, but I put all my meditation stuff and my workout and people say like, why are you putting there? No one cares. I said, it's not for anybody else. My Instagram stories are literally for me. At the end of the day, I like to look back and see what I did the whole day. It makes me proud of myself and feel like I'm doing a lot of good stuff. You know, I meditated, I worked out, I read this book, you know, I did this masterclass. Uh, that's for me. If other people look at it, I appreciate it. But like, uh, if the reason I stayed with Instagram is because I felt like I had the best control over it and I've never chased followers so everything is almost you know irrelevant to me inside of what actually happens it's just it's there i have no fomo on it i don't i don't look and wonder like boy this looks like uh great you know, I, like i'm not jealous of what other people are doing when i see people like in cool places great 
But the best thing that I've ever done on social media is every single month I go through everybody I'm following and delete all the ones that I'm not looking at consistently. You know, like sometimes something piques your interest, so you follow. And then anytime I'm looking and I a, a post annoys me, I just unfollow the person. You know, like on LinkedIn, if I can, I had to go back on uh, all the platforms because I did the team. I wanted to be at least visible. But like on LinkedIn, if somebody connects with me and then an auto question comes immediately, like a pitch, I just immediately unfollow and delete them. I do that, uh, too. I do that, too. Thing. Yeah, it's disappointing. It's a spammy culture. You know, and what you were saying about the comments, uh, I would relate most to my experiences on Medium. Uh, which I've had, I don't know, 10, 20 publications on Medium and uh, logged off, deleted my whole account once and came back. But I remember, you know, you write, it doesn't matter what you put out there. It could be a tweet, you know, something on a blog. Someone's going to have something to say. Most likely they're not going to have a picture of who they are. They're just there to create a problem. And we've all gone down the rabbit hole of the back and forth and it never helped. So yeah. Uh, I changed. And if somebody ever says anything that's negative and isn't like a wanting to have a dialogue, I just block them, delete the thing and never think about it again. And that's another Zen moment, which was a really, really hard thing for me to do. Because again, I was a trial attorney <laughs> for 10 years. I like to make arguments. I like, I feel like I'll always win, but you can't win against the troll or against the void of the internet. Right. And when you know that, save yourself so much time. And I think also, in my own case, it was a realization of time management. The funny mm -hmm. thing is when you have more time to yourself, you realize just how valuable your time is because you're not, you know, I'm, I'm not spending eight hours working on someone else's uh, white paper or building something for someone else that they're going to take credit for. And you get this tiny percentage of what it's really worth. So it's, you know, it, it, especially with COVID, it's made me really look at what I consume in terms of media. But it's also kind of laid bare that if 50% of the population thinks this, and I think this, wait a minute, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've really limited what I look at because no matter what side I'm on, you know, politically or spiritually, you know, mainstream news is just a conglomeration of extremes. So there's really no help for me to read the news or to read a site. I don't think any of it's actually correct most of the time because I'd much rather have the dialogue in the middle. But we're at a time, you know, here, at least in America, where you, it's very hard to have the dialogue in the middle because everybody wants the extremes. I'm happy to listen. I like debate. I, I like it. I just like friendly debate. You know, I don't really yeah. want to have, I like to hear other people's point of view. And if it, if it's based on something rational and reasonable, and honestly, even not, if it's presented in a, in a kind way, then I'm all open for hearing that. And I think social media is, you know, just a megaphone of, of garbage a lot of the time, because the most, the, the things that trend and hit the algorithms the most, they're the most extreme which is not a fair representation of what most of us want. No, very, very, very true. When I look at what gets more, you know, 30,000, 40,000 and up uh, visits on sites like YouTube or whatever, it's almost always the content with the exploitive clickbait titles, you yeah. know. Uh, one thing on that and the hardest thing about algorithms is they're not human so if you want to mm. look at what another side like the direct opposition of what you think is thinking and get educated on it and you watch something that's extreme on the other side you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to have all of that in your feed which is not what you want so i'm very very careful about what i look at and from which end of a browser like if i want to look at something that i think will skew what's going to be showed to me, I'll go into private mode on an unlogged in browser to look at that just so it doesn't affect, like you said, my time management is very important to me. I've taught time blocking classes and figuring out how to structure my day has been a huge, huge advantage for me. And it's why I can stay so efficient. But part of that is I don't 
I don't have to limit my time on social media because I limit what I follow so that when I'm looking at my feed, I don't follow a lot of people. I get through my feed to the last time, like pretty quickly. So there's not really anything left for me to scroll. I've done it. Yeah, I do that too. Um, when I first get up, have your tea, I look at the news. I look at Twitter. There's about three different virologists that I study on uh, Twitter just so I can be kept current on what's going on, you know, with, with the current situation. Um, maybe one or two. Yeah, I mean, I used to be into politics and I got completely burned out by it. It's just become so, like you said, extreme and tribal because they discovered that this works. Essentially, if you want to get the vote out, you want to create a cult. I mean, I think social media you know, in a lot of places is a cult. I mean, if you look at, I, yeah. I wrote a, lot, a bunch of articles about how there's like cult writing groups on, on Medium. It's completely correct. Uh, I, I, people just are unwilling to look because they're just so grabby and greedy these days about what they can get from it. Uh, but like on the other hand, people who make whatever a million dollars on TikTok, I don't have any problem with it at all. Like if it's just regular content, not extreme, like they're, if you can make a million dollars a year doing dances on TikTok, great job. You're just taking advantage of what's being given to you. You know, I think a lot of people are like mad that these kids can make all that money, but like people are watching it. They're just being smart. They're much smarter than the rest of us who were killing ourselves, like you said, in the grind for 80 hours a week for one tenth of what we were worth. So um, that's the kind of interesting part of it, you know. Uh, might they be catering to an audience? Yeah, but if the content is what they want, and it's, in my opinion, at least, just not like extreme, it's just regular content. Like, I mean, it is what it is. Everybody's selling an e-course now or, or something, and some are phenomenal, and some are garbage, like clickbait, and you have to figure out which is which. Um, but I think, you know, like we both said, the more that you go or inward and you're able to be still and be with yourself, it's much easier to see what's out there because you don't need the content. You're looking for something specific and you can quickly decide, oh, this this one's fake, this one's real. Um, and that's why I've always, like, everyone says, oh, you know, the Instagram algorithm, it, uh, it shows me a lot of stuff that I like. So I don't have a problem with it anymore. Like I buy a lot of stuff on Instagram. It's what I like if it works. It's just making my life easier. Do you think from a Zen perspective that there's more passivity and less deliberateness? Uh, on social media or just in general? Well, both. I, I don't think of being uh, still as, as passive. Uh, I, 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 I think of it as being active with self. And I think that's the, the different way that I look at it. For me, the more I can slow down and be still, I'm getting so much farther with myself and with giving myself perspective on other things. Here's one good thing, which I'm sure you you probably adjusted the same. I used to I used to just fire off emails, especially when I was a lawyer. You know, I'd get an email, I'd send back a mean email, or you know, you're arguing with someone and texting back and forth. I'm at the point where if I, I write an email and I don't like it, I put it in the hopper for a day and come back to it. I've never once sent that email when I came back to it. Not one time since I started doing that three years ago. I've modified them, but I look at it and I'm like, I needed a day break from that. And to me, that's that's where someone say, oh, you're, you know, you could construe that as being passive, like a break instead of, you know, protecting yourself. But it's an ego thing. You know, I'm fighting back with my ego and by giving myself this moment, it makes me more active. I'm going to be better because that conversation is going to be better than if I sent, you know, the bad email, which I still write a lot of them. Sometimes I just need to write them and then I immediately delete them. I just wanted to write it. Never going to send it. I had the feelings. Now they're out. Don't have to send it. But when we talk about social media use mm -hmm. is what's happening that there's more maybe passive maybe it's just not self-aware can consumer consumerism of, of of what they're being given and that's creating this there i think there's a lot of passive scrolling through social media which is a uh you know a time-wasting mechanism mechanism to to people like us who who look at it that way 
I think the people who are idly scrolling or are looking for something, there's something missing or you wouldn't spend four hours scrolling TikTok. It's not that good. It's entertaining. I like TikTok. I swore I'd never go on there. And I, it, it's fine because, again, I'm curating what I want. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot of that that goes around in terms of it's a replacement for something. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're blocking out the things you want to do, uh, I'm just not going to need that. But I think if you don't curate, you know, your followers on social media or your following, uh, you're more likely to get caught in a rabbit hole for sure. Yeah, I think it really goes back to no, you know, knowing what it is that you want to do with your time, as opposed to maybe, you know, working for other for, you know, in a job that you don't like, for an example, and which I've certainly had my fill of, you know, where you're on the bus or something, and you know, you really can't focus to the extent of reading or doing something really in depth. So let me look on whatever social media platform to pass the time. And if I get interrupted, it doesn't matter because everything's 10 seconds or what have you. On the flip side of that, what do you do to nurture your creativity while you're still in business? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really get into work mode. My, I mean, my plan is not to be into work mode until noon every day. I mean, I wake up early between five and six. I meditate for 30 minutes. Uh, I'll sometimes do some writing early. Um, and then I spend a lot of time with myself. I listen to a ton. I read a lot. Maybe uh, my most has been over 100 books in a year. This year, I probably end up around like 50. Uh, but I listen to another 20 to 30 on Audible. Um, I'm basically fill my mind before noon podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of, I've done, I've completed 33 master classes, which people think is crazy. They're like, what do you need to know all that stuff? And I said, I think you're misunderstanding. I don't need to know any of it. I want to know it. I like to know a lot of stuff and it's frankly, it's fascinating. They're like, well, you're not going to be an astronaut. Why'd you watch the Chris Hatfield? astronaut one i'm like because it's amazing <laughs> right like, why do you have to become why do you have to want to exactly. become an astronaut in order to want to study astronomy i think that's that's ridiculous it's almost yeah why why did you read a book if you're not gonna you know why'd you read a fiction book it's not real because huh? it i like it. It, it, it transports me to somewhere else and good writing brings me you know, it makes me happy. I like, I like being in another world. This world's, you know, average. Right. You, it helps you expand your vocabulary. It, it, it helps you generate more gray matter. I mean, it, de it develops your, your equilibrium. It helps you on across the board. So what have you read recently that's uh, stood out for you? Uh, I, I read, I'm reading a lot. Um, I actually better pull up one of my <laughs> lists. I, I like Ken Liu. I read one of his uh, I'm trying to remember which book I just read, but I'm reading the third book by him. It's like sci-fi short stories. Mm. And they're insane. Uh, again, mind expanding. Like you said, it's like, I, I want to know that there's other people who can get out there creatively uh, and just leave me thinking like, wow. Uh, I do read a lot of, you know, business, uh, real estate or kind of management books that that push me uh, forward, but I read Zen stuff as well. Uh, read fiction also, but Ken Liu is just one author that recently is just like blown my mind <laughs> with the with the type of creativity and and worlds that are out there. Um, and then uh, you know on the business side, I have a book club on my team, so we read twelve books a year. They're finishing Rich Dad Poor Dad now. For I've read it a, a few times, but books like that are things that I come back to once a year. And I think this will actually fit in well here. One practice that I used to not do is I used to not reread books because I would think like, well, I read them. So why would I read it again? Really? You know, I read another book. But now I found, I mean, so much more value out of reading books that I like a second time because the impact is like triple because we're, we're never really paying. I mean, come on, people are reading their phones going off. When I'm reading it a second time, when my highlights are in the book, I'm just learning like at a 10 X level. And that helps me with implementation more. Um, so like the slight edge by Jeff Olson is a book that I just, I love, I recommend it to everybody. Uh, it really straightens out my head in terms of like how easy everything is. 
if you just boil it down to the smallest, you know, part of simple, like I just got to do one thing tomorrow, the next day I can do 1.0001 of that. And in 365 days, I will have accomplished so much if I'm just consistent, but the consistency is the problem. That reminds me of Walden, actually. And I know you've read Walden. Yeah. And I remember telling somebody recently that I thought Walden was a business book, but people just don't know it. Would you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. You know, it, the value of simplifying, you're not doing more so you can do more, but it basically be more mindful or more aware of what you're doing, why you're doing it. What can I do so that this is this is what I do is what only I can do. It's a better use of my time and my energy. So if if I were to, for example, write a novel, it's not going to be the same as the one that Jonathan Green writes because you're a completely different person, different yeah. word choices, different aptitudes, and so on. Um, so yeah, to that extent, it does seem, you know, that when we look more at why we're doing things more deliberately, we get more done. When, what do you think, I mean, as far as being a gallerist, being a, a real estate developer, realtor, being a lawyer, which one stands out or is it an amalgamation for you? Yeah, I kind of love that it is an amalgamation for me. I mean, a lot of people look at my diverse background and think like, oh, well, you, you know, you change careers a lot. Something must have gone wrong. No, not it, they ran their course. I mean, you know, 10 years of doing trial work is a lot. I did over 250 trials. Like, that's a lot. And I was dealing, you know, in the criminal system. So it's a lot. And then I had kids and I, I didn't want to bring that home with me. And then I think learning to transition to new things, you know, going into the art world for six years without a bunch of uh, experience in it taught me so much that I still use. The thing is, I've learned to take everything that I've done and apply it to whatever I'm doing. So, you know, being a lawyer was negotiation. I'm really good at negotiation, but I understand we're not negotiating over life or death now. We're negotiating over real estate, which, you know, with what you said about Walden takes me back. It's just a little bit more of perspective. I can take any book. Everything's a business book to me because I'm only good at business if I'm good at life. So if I have my life straight, I'm going to be better um, at business that way. So it's easier to transition. And when I look at what I learned from the art world, I take the curatorial aspect of when I'm flipping homes and staging them now um, and teaching. Uh, I taught for three years and, and was a mentor at a school and and doing that helped me get a little bit more empathetic when I'm, I'm just not naturally empathetic. And I think that just taught me a lot about teaching and mentoring and what it's like to to for someone to not know the answers and for you to say it, it's OK you know, try again in the nice way, but also learn, you know, what other people, especially at the time, my kids were like about, my son was about 10 when I was teaching college age students and the differential was interesting. Now my kids are 19 and 18. So I kind of had some experience uh, seeing there. So I, I do think of myself as a kind of a mixture of everything and I wouldn't want it any other way. When I get bored with something, I do something else. Um, and I'm fortunate enough that I can do that. Um, I, you know, I know that some people do just have to keep doing the job, but I really think if you pre-plan it and you figure it out, there's always a way to transition into something new, but I would never suggest somebody just quit, you know, not have a runway, uh, to do it and then just think things are going to work out. I'm just much more planned than that. Uh, although I am, I mean, with, with work, I'm willing to risk cause I'm betting on myself that I can learn stuff fast. Uh, and again, like you said, uh, using my diverse background helps me go into any new endeavor uh, because I, I have a lot of different things that I can bring to the table. I want to ask your take on a question here that I, I've been on podcasts where they ask me this question. Sure. But with your background, I really want to get your take on it. 
given you know the circumstances with the economy with covid and everything that's been going on for the last year or two what do you think or how would you prescribe for businesses that are struggling right now what could they do to try to pivot and reboot whether it's a brand or just the entire you know business from the bottom up uh, I mean, I think when things are going hard, people make the worst decisions in business. They start to get more salesy and more call to action and more grabby because they're trying to get back what they think they have lost, which is is valid, but it's a terrible strategy because what I want to do is I always am trying to understand who my clients are and what they need, no matter what business it is. And I always want to start to work with more for me, because I'm a writer, I, I'm always thinking more storytelling aspects and more developing relationships. Uh, I'm just not a salesperson. I'm in a sales, you know, sales business, but I don't, I don't try to do sales. I try to build relationships. And I think every single business that is in that trouble zone should be working on the relationship aspect. How can they get across their core values to somebody else uh, instead of kind of going for the the home run call to action, clickbait type marketing that is always short lived. It's hard to look long term when you're struggling because you have to get from A to B. But you will most of the time when you think short term, we'll maybe get to A to B. You'll just never get beyond that. If you plan long term, you definitely have to scrap for a little while to put things together. But I mean, how many of us have gotten involved in more multi hyphenate lifestyles, especially during COVID? People you know, move jobs, left jobs. So I always have a, a couple different ways that I, you know, can make money or invest in different things. Uh, so I've stayed diversified, like my background in investments as well. And I think businesses are well suited to, to be thinking much more about core values at a time like this, storytelling and relationship building than like pressure sales. It just doesn't work. It's <laughs> how can you compete with everything else that's out there selling you all the time? You have to come in with something different or else you're just another automaton, uh, you know, a, you're, you're a human algorithm. Tell me about assemblage. What's that all about? So I, uh, I started, I started writing on medium, maybe in like 2016. Uh, it was really just a way to rid my get thoughts out of my brain. Um, so I started writing things went well, and the medium makes it very easy to create your own publication. So uh, assemblage was actually the third or fourth publication that I made. Um, but it is to what the art term is. It came from the art term, which is just basically a mixture uh, of work, uh, different kinds of work all fused together that, that feel like it, it works together. So I created that. It's basically a publication portal uh, that runs five publications. We're only publishing one now, which is poetry publication called Loose Words on Medium. Um, and I tried to do it off site, but it's just so much work. You know, I've gone back and forth with being on medium and off medium, but um, in general, it's a portal for creative writers to work together. Um, and, you know, I just, I'm the only editor and publisher of what goes out. Um, you know, I took them all down for the last three months and then work, you know, poetry is a big part of my life. So um, just from, again, from time management, it's much easier for me to edit other people's poetry because there's usually be one or two minutes you know, when I'm editing essays and I have three 13 minute essays uh, to edit and make sure they're all perfect, it's just going to take up too much time with with what I'm doing in business. So I've trimmed it down a little, but um, I love being a creative. I love writing uh, and I love working with other writers and, you know, publishing their work. I just have to be careful not to go on overload, which I think is what a lot of us need to kind of check ourselves on these days. Now, when you said you get into poetry, who do you like and why? Well, first of all, I should reverse uh, that and say why poetry and then who do you like? Yeah, uh, poetry for me is the most pure form of me being creative with my thoughts. I like writing essays, but poetry is something that I took a poetry class in college. I was a criminal justice major and I, I loved it, but I didn't think much of it at the time. And I didn't really write much more after that. Uh, and as I started getting, you know, writing more, I was writing a ton of essays. Um, and then I was just started to write poetry and I, I, it felt really good. 
it felt like I was like I was able to write things that I couldn't write, you know, about losing my parents or about things that poetry just made it uh, beautiful to me. And I found some rhythm in what I write. And when I it's similar to what I was saying about um, like what I would put on social media, I, I literally don't care. I love writing poetry. If no one reads it, no problem. I, when I'm finished, I'm very, very like happy with myself. And it's kind of just like a, uh, it just unburdens a bunch of things inside of me. And it's funny because during COVID, like it was dark. I mean, my poetry was dark, but this is how poetry works. It's emotional. It comes from inside. Um, and I have a unique process. I can write a fully formed poem in like 10 minutes and people think that's crazy. You know, I, this is just how I work. My brain is like a, a editing as I go. Uh, and it's just something that it's really changed a lot of my creative. I don't even really like to write essays anymore. I just like to write and edit other people's poetry. It's why Loose Words is really mm. the only one that's publishing now. It's just more of a, I just find it so creative. Um, you know, offline, obviously, you're using all sorts of different spacing. Um, but online, you're a little bit more constrained in terms of the um, the way that it looks. But I think it's helpful because there's so many writers. Um, you know, anytime you're in the creative arts, everybody thinks they're a writer uh, and a poet. It's a very difficult thing to run publications and have people want to publish it. And uh, uh, it's not really a personal thing. There's plenty of people. I, I don't. I'm not in love with every person that I publish, but I see. I it's it's strong work. Might not be my favorite, and I think that again makes it less about me as an ego, you know, publisher. But um, you know, I, I read all sorts of, of poetry, modern, old. I mean, uh, Sylvia Plath. I can I can read uh, over and over uh, and just get confused and uh, scared. Uh, and then I read a lot of modern uh, modern poetry as well. Uh, anything that comes out that's new uh, and different, I will put in a, and read. Uh, and I don't really go by the standard of people who think uh, some poets, you know, became uh, famous. Like I love Rupi Kaur. Uh, I love Homie by Dane Smith. Um, and there's just, I, I found that reading poetry helps me become a better poet. Um, to something you said before, I can read something in somebody else's work and just three words will turn into a poem for me. I don't even look at what they wrote. I, those three words mean something to me that becomes something else. And I always say where I got the inspiration from. That's the best thing about the creative arts, writing, art, painting, sculpture, all of that. Uh, it's all based on being influenced by something else. And, you know, thinking that we reinvented the wheel and created something nobody's ever said or done is, is almost silly at this point. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, I remember reading a long time ago that uh, in Shakespeare's day, there was a play already in production called Hamlet that uh, whoever Shakespeare was saw the play and said, oh, I think I could do better. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. But it wasn't wholly original. In fact, I think his, he had a son named Hamlet because he liked it so much and thought, I'm good, just going to take it. And the irony, of course, is we really don't know for certain who Shakespeare was. It's probably Edward de Vere, but we don't know for sure. You know, I'm, I'm stuck between Pablo Neruda right now and... Um, there was another lady, I, I can't remember her name, but I'm just slowly getting back into poetry. Um, I, I think to read poetry the right way, you have to be in a good mental headspace. You, you yeah. Don't get anything out of it. Um, the one thing I'll say about poetry is I don't dig beneath the surface. You know, like you're trained when you're in poetry classes to yes. over-interpret over everything, but I like words, so I'm just... Yeah, words and the way I write, there's nothing behind it. It's it's just the words, uh, because I I'm not in their minds. I like to read stuff if they said what they were thinking when they wrote that, but I don't. I'm not there to interpret. You know that I just want to enjoy it. Yeah, the thing is, I went to college to I wanted to be a writer. That was my goal. Um, I eventually graduated with a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing, but. 
after I worked a couple of internships, I realized that there were no really well-paying jobs for writers or editors where I lived in Virginia back then. There probably still aren't in that area. No, they're not. You know, but I realized after those internships, there were decent jobs at the marketing agencies. So if I went to the marketing agency and said, well, I'm probably a better writer than most people you're going to get off the street. And I'm probably a better web developer than most people who aren't interested in it at all. Okay, maybe then I could get my foot in the door and earn a decent wage. But the funny thing is, like you said, by the time I graduated, I didn't really enjoy writing anymore because they had flensed all of that out of me. I couldn't read anything without diagramming the sentences or looking at the the thematic uh, symbols of it. Or why does you know? I, I've fallen into that trap over the over the years, and in, in a hybrid way, where I found myself writing because I knew people would want to read this, and then I would read it, and it would just do nothing for me. And <laughs> yeah, that's why poetry is so different to me. It's just my insides exposed on the page so and and also when you're talking about the social media world if you're publishing poetry online nobody comes by and trolls a poem i mean you know like if i write anything about love relationships you know business marketing somebody's gonna have something stupid to say poetry they're not even reading it so it's a very troll free environment to write um there is a lot of people who you know again like i said believe they're great poets and they don't like to answer no but um that's i think with any creative field especially you know during covid when everyone became a, a creative which i i'm if they can be great but i think we all have to know like you know i, I read people who the words m like just shock me because i know there's always people who are better than me i think i'm a good poet but i love reading people who are, are amazing poets who maybe other people don't know, but it just does stuff for me. Yeah, I think it's helpful to be humble. And um, I've got two books out now, but I honestly have to say, I don't know, and I don't really think it's my place to say whether they're good or bad. I think it's up to the individual. If you read it and you get something from it and you enjoy it, that's great. But for me to stand up and say it's the greatest book of all, I don't know that. And I think it, it I don't think it's beneficial to to do that. And then it's going back to the ego. You know, the, the more creative, the better, the more, uh, the more, what's that uh, expression where you, you boil it and the, the salt comes out. I forget what the term is now. Uh, but the, the you know the more boiled down you are, so to speak, the the more authentic you can be. I just write whatever I I used to really really heavily think it, overthink it, and I just read some. There was a blog that I read. I think it was a blog from a pops musician called the Red Hand Diaries. I think it is. Mm -hmm. And I have to min I don't want to minimize the screen to look for it, but I think that's what it's called. And he's like a pop musician and he wrote a blog post about writing, you know, is just your way of saying, you know, here I am to the universe. There's no wrong or right if you put your heart into it. And I remember one of my icons, Ray Bradbury, saying that it's our way of saying no to death. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually I read writing and poetry quotes all the time because I really gives me perspective, you know, which we've talked about a lot. Writing to me gives me perspective and it allows me to just spill it out. And I did need to get to a point where I really, it made no difference. I wasn't looking at my stats and how many people read. I don't care. I really, right. it feels so good when I release it and I feel so good about it that it's of no consequence whether it's very nice when people like it, but I'd be fine if I got nothing from it because I like it. The truth is, if one person reads what you wrote and it resonates with them sufficiently. That's a success. Right. So if, if it resonates with them sufficiently that they have an emotional reaction, then you've accomplished your objective. Or if they see something in a different way, then you've achieved your objective ultimately. Well, uh, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us. Do you have any parting thoughts? 
And after that, I would just ask you how people can get in touch with you to learn about your uh, business uh, interests. Yeah. Of course. No, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciated the conversation. I like mindful talk and uh, ways to expand other people's thoughts. That's not, you know, just what everybody else is doing. So I really uh, feel good about this and appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Um, no, I mean, I think we, we covered a lot. And I think the, the biggest things I've learned are all tied up in that quote, don't rush life. And every year I, I get older and I want to appreciate more of what's in front of me. Uh, and, you know, as my kids get older, I want to make sure I'm, I'm giving them as much freedom as I can, but not missing any time that I, that I could spend with them. And I think those things have really taken me from, you know, the difference between me at 40 and me at 50 is very, very drastically uh, helpful to me going forward as a, as a mindful uh, person. Um, so I, my hub site is actually at trustgreen.com and green has an E at the end. Um, that Medium publication, you can find me all over Medium, but the one that's active right now is is Loose Words. You can just search that on Medium. And my business is Streamline Properties on Market, brokered by EXP Realty, and that's at streamlined with a D dot properties. Um, I have a coaching site too, but there you can find everything inside my hub site at Trust Screen. And that has some of my writing. It has the redirects to, to Medium, to my life coaching, to my business. Um, but again, like I said, I'm very like low on the calls to action. Uh, you can find me on uh, most social at Trust Screen, and that's where I think uh, it's very clear that everything we talked about comes across very clear on something like Instagram. I post what I want. It's just for me. If other people like it, great. And I think that's the same reason why I follow other people. I want to see, you know, houses and puppies. So that's what I follow. <laughs> and, if the, you know, that that's the good thing about it. But uh I don't want to ever let social media get away from me again. I keep it pretty tightly curated from my art days to, to make my life better that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again for your time and uh, take care of yourself. Thanks so much, David. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.